morning, evening, afternoon, whatever the time is where you are, and welcome to Murder and Coffee, TBK Roleplay's GM talk show where we discuss all things TTRPGs and game mastering. I am Osarix Franco, a reckless purveyor of shenanigans and one of your hosts this afternoon. My co-host, as always, is Lady of Fort TPK herself. It's Luke Lot. Hi, uh, today we will be talking about the three pillars of TTRPGs with an exceptional guest, Aaron King. We will be accepting audience questions from all of you GMs and intrepid adventurers throughout the stream, so feel free to post them in chat. Uh, but before we get to all that, let's introduce our guest. Aaron King is a zinester and game designer being cool in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, they co-host Read the Fucking Manual, or RTFM, an RPG book, cl book club podcast. And they've created games like Patchwork, Patchwork World, which I cannot say, and After the Bomb. It. Welcome to Murder and Coffee, Aaron. Uh, we're so excited to have you. Uh, first questions first. What fine brew are we enjoying today? <laughs> I need to know. I had, I had a pot of coffee this morning and then my first coffee lemonade of the season. Ooh. Which is a, like a cold press lemonade. Nice. And I've been up. It's two o'clock for me, 2 p.m. I've been up since a seven. Coffee so. lemonade. Yeah. You got to take pity on our poor Mormon souls. <laughs> yeah, wait. Now, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. It's lemonade with coffee in yeah. it or? Half, half and half. I, I love Luca's face right now. You, you completely love to, her mind. I'm trying to imagine what lemonade would taste like with coffee. And now I'm going to have to do this. You can just buy these places? Uh, well, you, you can buy them separate. I don't know. If you go to a coffee shop that has lemonade, they'll do it for you. It's a thing that people know about. This isn't <laughs> just like a... Yeah, so there's a coffee shop here that Shame made... your coffee. I'm just, I've never heard of this, and it seems like the wildest. It's like if someone was like, well, yeah, I'm eating a peanut butter and tuna sandwich. It's fine. Yeah. It's like, what? Listen, bud. Sometimes the mood strikes. Okay. What does it taste like? Tell me what it tastes like. Uh, I mean, it depends on the lemonade. Like, I don't like super sweet lemonade, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It's really acidic, so like, make sure you eat something first. Mm, yeah yeah I, I don't know it's just sweet with like a kind of what what it's do you call sweet? coffee well because lemonade is sweet right yeah mm -hmm. um well lemonade i would call tart and coffee i would call bitter unless you put in sugar right right so i'm yeah. imagining this like face scrunching like drink of tart and bitter it kind of even sweet out. okay because cold it brew is like a little smoother would you say like would you say it creates a good sense of umami? I'll say that. I, I had I to. I won't stand by it. You don't have to though. <laughs> you are legally out. I'm pretty sure Tony can Tony can vouch. I'm pretty sure there was a word that we were gonna try and spit in, and I'm pretty sure my word was umami. I can't recall, but this feels right to me. It feels right. Um awesome. Well, I'm making coffee because uh, I planned my life poorly, uh, and I will be drinking some shortly. Not too much, though, or I will never sleep again. Uh, Luca, are you joining me in this this early afternoon coffee quest? I also planned my life poorly and was out of coffee except for a <gasps> packet that I got for free when I went into a department store uh, to grab some groceries. It was Target and they were handing out free samples oh, no. of coffee in a little packet. Oh no. And I was scrambling and I found it and I was like, yep, that'll do. It'll do. Oh, no. What kind is it? Coffee. It's like the most, co it's like, this is medium roast coffee of coffee beans. The beans are coffee flavored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I put in some hot cocoa powder though. To make it oh, oh there you yeah. go there you go there yeah. you go um so aaron uh we've brought you here today to talk about some stuff and some things and i'm really excited to get into it but before we do uh could you give like a little brief intro of what got you into ttrpgs and you know particularly uh running games yourself sure um i have not been running games that long i spent a lot of my allowance on role-playing games at like Walden Books in a mall when I was Amazing. 11 Walden. or whatever. Uh, 
So I'm 38 now, so that would have been Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and like the second editions of World of Darkness stuff and did not really get into actively running games until November of 2014, which I think is when fifth edition was coming out. And mm -hmm. some friends of mine at work said, have you ever heard of this Dungeons and Dragons? And I revealed my secret shame that I had um, <laughs> and started running weekly games that were uh, drop in. And so there was a pool of at one time, like 14 players, but no more than, you know, seven would make it often it would just be three or four uh and we would just play every week whoever could make it um and i'm still playing with like the mutated version of that group uh whatever it is eight years later that's amazing so i here's my follow-up question to that like you played for a long time before you actually started running games was there a particular reason that you were just nope I mean, yeah, usually I, people hop right into the DMing after they've played a few games. They're like, I'm going to do this now. When I was a kid, I uh, didn't have anyone to play with. Like, I was literally just buying these books and reading them. And, like, I think I played once or twice with a friend of mine, just one friend that I had convinced to try. Uh, but it was more just, like, reading and imagining. I was in a town of mm. 500 people, so I didn't have a ton of friends to try to coerce into this. Um, that is the right word, coerce. <laughs> Correct. And Correct. in college, my second time in college, after I quit and went back, a friend of mine was running a fourth edition game and invited me to play. And we played just about every week for a year or so. And like a full one to, in fourth edition, it was 30, level 30 campaign. Wow. Um, and so that was in really fourth fun. fourth edition, it was 30? Yeah. Because they have three that? years of play. So, um, yeah, and there was no real reason for me to run that anything then because we just had, again, it was a small college. It was a town of 5,000 people. And so we just had this one gaming group. And if someone else was running something that would like eat into those troops. Uh, so we did that. And then I moved to Minneapolis around 2010, I think, and just didn't, wasn't buying games at that time and didn't know anyone that played. So. Uh, was reading at that point a lot of blogs, like a lot of OSR blogs that were pretty popular at the time. And so I was thinking about it a lot mm -hmm. and was listening to Adventure Zone and stuff like that. Same. Whoop, whoop, represent. <laughs> but just, yeah, again, like didn't know anyone. And then all of a sudden, like Stranger Things came out and everyone was getting interested in it then. So. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, uh, I mean, you write uh, teach RPGs. When did you write your first one? I'm sorry, the, we've gone off the rails, but now I'm not, I need to know. I need all the, <laughs> yes. the details. Give us, if you could just outline for us uh, from beginning to end your life and how TTRPGs have influenced <laughs> it. In Austin, Texas in 1983. That's, that is the new, it, we're changing everything. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so I, when I moved to Minneapolis, volunteered at a, like a radical bookstore and um, we carried a lot of zines we had a whole rack mm -hmm. and we would just if anyone came in and said will you sell these we would just quickly make ah, sure they weren't fuck, like i've been pretty much pronouncing it zine this whole time i wasn't gonna guys. say anything it's okay it's fine it's, no shame. i'm gonna say it i'm gonna say it however i want to say it i'm my own person okay. i'm green hair he said that and instantly i was like the amount of times <laughs> i've said this word in front of people it's totally okay uh, Continue. <laughs> it happens all the time but yeah and so i was getting into just making my own little stories and stuff i was like editing and doing layout and publishing other people's chapbooks, uh, poetry and stuff like that. And so when I started running D&D, it was just really easy for me to fit that kind of content into the stuff that I'd already been reading and thinking about it as a way of just getting it out there, giving it to other people. And, um, you know, I think, I assume you both have experienced this too. Like once you start running games, you start designing at least something, whether it's just a new monster or you know mm -hmm. a new ability for a player or something. Like it's very hard to run a game without starting to add content and wonder mm -hmm. oh, why does this work this way? I want to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a natural step, I think. Gotcha. Um, so I did Zine Quest in 2018 or 2019, wherever the first one was, and published a little box of a bunch of 
5e uh, supplements and then kind of divested myself from like 5e and hasbro mm -hmm. my sister's getting a pizza so if you hear a ringtone and then you'll see someone with pizza and then you'll see two cats following um are they following I, for the pizza pizza cat probably yeah yeah i would yeah. assume um but yeah and then have tried to make my own things uh it's also and we might get into this more later but like I love when someone I know releases a game and then I can make a little supplement for it just as a way mm -hmm. of saying like, I see what you're doing and I like it and it like inspires me and I want the people I know to also like your cool game. Um, and so it becomes partially a hobby. I mean, I just do it because I think about it and want to put it mm -hmm. down on paper, but partially like an aspect of making community as well. I love that. I think that's great. Um... Speaking of the things that we're actually speaking about today and the sense of community, uh, today's topic came because uh, I reached out to you and I said, Aaron, please, please, please <laughs> come on, we're doing coffee, please. And you said, OK. <laughs> and I said, you know, what would you want to talk about? And you sent me two tweets. Uh, and one of the tweets was uh, talking about the three pillars of TTRPGs, what the true pillars of TTRPGs are. Would you mind sharing what they are with us? Yeah, currently they are. In this moment. Uh, shenanigans and flirting and making forts. Those are the three, in any role-playing game you ever play, those are the three most important things that you can enable players to do. Truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just want to get out there. I saw that and I went, yup, pretty much. Yeah. Like, it's uh, the different aspects of it uh, notwithstanding. Like, Luca, how does that strike you? Because I know for me, it was immediately like, yes, 100, 110% is correct. Um, yeah, I feel like shenanigans, number one. Uh, if anything ever had to be reduced to a single pillar, that would be the one that would remain. But uh, yeah, the others, uh, fort building? Yes. Um, I feel like that's true just of RP RPGs, not just TTRPGs. It's like, find me in any RPG nesting somewhere. Um, uh, yeah, and then flirting. Yeah, yeah. Even if it's not romantic, you're flirting with everyone at the table. So, I, you're just having fun with your friends, goofing off, like, absolutely. Um, I approved, yes. But I want to know, how do you incorporate these, like, in your table? Because I can instantly think of my tables and how it's like, yes, yes. Yes, uh, but I want to know your games. How do you go about incorporating these three pillars? Uh, yeah, a lot of it is player led. Like I've been so lucky to have friends that will hang out almost every week and just like bring themselves to a game. Um, and it started when I was trying to get off of fifth edition and um, I thought I'll just write a game for these people that have been playing games with me every week for so long. And if other people like it or find use for it, that's awesome. But like, I want to enable the things they've been doing. Um, Cause we played 5e for years. And so we would get to, you know, level 10. I think we, at one point we got to level 12 and then we did like a time jump and made new characters and stuff. But a lot of people in my group had never played RPGs before and or had ADHD and or anxiety. And so reaching level 12 was sometimes creating problems of just like, I don't remember what I can do. We leveled up, mm. you told me, it was the end of the night. I wrote down like chase monsters, stolen underwear question mark. I don't remember like what that has this to do with what relatable. I can do. Right, and so I just thought like, it was during the pandemic. And Why so are we here? <laughs> right. Like if I can take this moment to like break a game down and build something that reflects what these people want. And so I literally sent an email out that was like, what are your favorite parts of these games we've been playing for years? Um, what have been the hard parts? What have been the parts that like you feel that I bring to the game that you enjoy? And um, just started writing the game that became Patchwork World. Um, and that game does incorporate, I mean, there are, Sarah's played. It, top tier like, shenanigans, <laughs> top tier. Shenanigans. Like, 
so the good. basic moves that involve like kind of persuasion and getting a read on people all have an option for flirting or finding out if someone likes you. Um, there's like an optional move for going on a date if you want to collapse that down into just a roll or two. And then um, fort building as well is just you can start with a tavern or a castle and you can kind of level that up as you level yourself up and um, you know hang up that stolen underwear so that we all remember it's there on your tavern sheet you don't have to have a question mark right. on your character sheet anymore underwear um, confirmed right we and actually so, do have the stolen underwear it's right there yes it, it granted us plus one whatever <laughs> we hung it above the mantle in our castle Amazing. but yeah it's it's less me uh making it happen at a table than naming behaviors that I saw people enjoying the most and just trying to shine a spotlight on those behaviors. I think that's an important distinction that, that that's kind of what comes naturally uh, from games because I feel like shena- 100% shenanigans. Like the reason I play TTRPGs is I listened to the Adventure Zone and I went, wait a minute, you're just sitting around a table bullshitting with your friends. Like I've been bamboozled. I thought there was so much more to this. No, you literally (laughs) are just being idiots with your friends. Like, are you kidding me? I want in. Um, And like flirting is a part of that, right? Like it, it kind of lends itself, or I would say like human connection, like flirting is kind of that shorthand for that. Right. Uh, The one thing that I feel like I personally don't leverage that much is forts. Like I feel like, that's not something I, Sarah, have ever accounted for in a game. I'm always like, move to the next town, you guys. Get to the next thing. And I think That's that, like... such a weakness of mine. It's, <laughs> like, I feel like I need, in order to up my games, I need to lean more on that fort piece. Because Harper's wasn't present. real until we had the hideout. <laughs> Just, we, we needed that fort. But, yeah, I, and it's not... Uh, you know, if you are doing a really mobile campaign, if you are drifters going from city to city, the fort thing is hard. Um, what I have done then in those cases, because I do love like a hex crawl kind of thing, mm-hmm. but I just give them like a mobile fort. Like they have a big wagon or like a giant bird robot and they live in it. Um, and then the fort moves so with s- them. So specific. A giant <laughs> bird robot. It's an- it mansion. happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, like a mansion. Yeah, a moving mansion is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, as a player, picked up Mordekainen's mansion or whatever mm-hmm. uh, in 5e. And that's been a game changer, right? Because it's like, oh, no, we can go someplace and be safe. <laughs> like, we're going to do that now. I'm just going to put gonna my go house be safe. right here. Mm-hmm. Just for a minute. And then our GM's like, are you? And it's like, fuck. Uh, yeah, and part of it also came from, you know, I had a rotating cast of players every week. And so we kind of had to end an adventure in a single session. Mm-hmm. And they had to have a place to come back to so that when we started the next session, there'd be no like, wait, where did you go? You're in a different town than when I last played. How do I get there kind of thing? It just became like, you end up at home at the end of every session. You start every session at home. Mm-hmm. And then that becomes like, cool, we're putting our weird stuff there. The horn that we got off this monster. This guy that we saved from zombies, uh, we're paying him to be our butler now. He lives here and cleans up when we're not here. You know, I invite my slug-eyed sewer guild girlfriend over and everyone's hiding and like telling me how to go on this date kind of thing. Like the home becomes very important once you just say like, this is your place, you can do whatever you want with it. And it is, I think also like a power fantasy because like, I'm probably never going to own a home. <laughs> and Oof. Lots Oof. Of my why why are Oof. you bringing such pain to the studio oh. today? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so true. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I had the same thing with Harper's with the rotating cast. And it was like, we need a, we need a home base to end and start each session to go out on the missions. And that was where everyone started doing like downtime text role play. It was like, we're all just hanging out in the base like what are you doing i'm chilling in the mess hall i'm chill yeah and then it was like now we have a pet here and it was a whole it's only a matter of time yep so as so my question like following up on that because like a lot of the times for me hello hi hello i'm sarah i'm an anxious person uh when i think about like setting up a fort or like managing something particularly like if we're leveling up or doing that stuff like as the person who's prepping that stuff i get overwhelmed like 
it's just like, man, I'm having to think about enemies and treasure and all this stuff. And now like I have this other piece of it, which is like less intuitive than just like RP for, for someone of my style. What tips would you have for someone like here's here's an easy way or like, you know, systems, resources that you guys have found to help make forts easier? Yeah, a lot of it is just I try to just be very clear. Um, you know, like I have players that are just like, I don't want if I get a pet, I don't want to then see it die in three sessions. Yeah. It's, so I either That's don't fair. want a pet or can you tell me that you won't, you know, and I'm like, yeah. yes is kidnapping the pet okay if it is kept you know we discuss yeah. that and it's the same with a fort too where like sometimes we do have rules or like you can spend this much gold to add this to it sometimes it's just a sheet of paper folded up and someone will draw the outline you know here's our tavern or here's our castle and then you just have a list of stuff on the side and like this is the stuff you keep there these are the people that hang out there um and it becomes, it takes some mental load off of the character sheet. So there's people that yes. have a problem with like, what is this thing I wrote down? They can just say like, I'm just putting it over here. And if I want to think about it, I can pick up this sheet and look at it. But also I can just offload that. And um, Patrick World has specific moves for like, it's just kind of like when you level up, you can put your experience into this place. You just check this thing off a list like a lot of the other moves which is common in so many powered by the apocalypse games of just like you just pick this option mm -hmm. sometimes it means you roll at the start of a session sometimes it means you do yeah. one roll when you stay there for a week or whatever um mm -hmm. and it is just about for me trying to reduce all these worries into just a single thing and then making it clear like i'm not going to attack your base or if i do it's going to be so telegraphed i will say these baddies are building an army. If you don't take care of them, maybe in five sessions, they might come after you. Mm. What do you want to do about that kind of thing? Um, and I think a lot of that, um, you know, with Critical Role and Adventure Zone, um, there's a lot of idea and talk about like building a story, building a narrative, yeah, building drama. Um, and I think in those talks like sometimes just very player to player mechanical talk about like these guys are going to do this in a month they're going to come after you like that can kind of reduce drama and I, that's mm -hmm. a weakness of that talk mm -hmm. but like i'm not streaming my games we don't record yeah. them like this is just for us and i want it to be fun and if people are getting stressed out that's not fun for me right um and so i'm happy to sacrifice some of that drama for just like some clear communication and some clear mm -hmm. stakes and um like this is for us for me that game is like a private act i have public persona obviously i'm here on yeah stream. yeah I've yeah played games on streams um and that is very different for me and i would play differently i would act differently but... yeah yeah but i think that's a massive a massive point to make because a lot of the times when we're talking about this like even like most of my games have been streamed. The games that Luke is referencing have been streamed and those in-player interactions that, you know, uh, are happening in Discord behind the scenes and, and stuff like that. And with Critical Role, with the Adventure Zone, you don't really get the nitty gritty conversations of, okay, are we leveling up the kitchen or are we leveling up the the wall? Because like, you know, we got poison last time because uh, the role was, or what have you. Right. Um, and you do miss out on uh, a wide spectrum of the TTRPG, like, experience, I think. Because you're just not seeing it. Or legitimately, as players streaming, you're not playing it. Right. Uh, my other long-running campaign is just with two friends. I call it my dad game because they're two dads. They live in, like, three hours away in the same town. They're both professors. And so they run into each other all the time. They're in this town of 5,000 people and they have sort of sworn not to talk about the game when they run into each other because my one friend Kyle in the game made this very good point that like, that's an act of play. Like you're playing the game when you're saying, what should we do next time we play? Mm. Um, what did you think about this thing that happened? And he's like, let's just save that for when we're together. Like, cause that can be for us, you know, they both have kids, they both have full-time jobs and spouses. Like, he wants to keep that play time in a place where it benefits everyone and like keep it separate and keep it kind of sacred. And um, so yeah, like play 
is that drama and is constructing that story, but it's also like talking about these things and coming to a fun mutual decision. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's absolutely correct. Like, even like, hey, you're leveling up, Luca. What spells are you gonna pick at the fifth level so we know like how to balance our characters? Like, that's part of it, right? It is about finding that balance. I like that a whole bunch. Um, Luca, even you got just any? with the like, um the alchemy room or the herbalist room it was like mm -hmm. oh we can grow these now i'm making these potions what else do you guys want me to make yes we're gonna be able to use this and do this next time or you guys i've got these buffs now did everyone go and eat in the kitchen because it'll give you this buff and like mm -hmm. do you know what i mean so uh but w when i did that i found on dm's guild uh for harper it's just a, a resource that basically did all the thinking for me like you were talking about nice. with anxiety uh, it's called Fortresses, Temples, and Strongholds. And it basically just tells you, like, what rooms do you want to have? There's, like, upgrades you can have, but, like, here's the benefits of having those rooms. And there's, like, downtime benefits. There's other, you know, like, there's crafting benefits. There's actual, like, it'll affect once you're out on the job, kind of. And it was really cool, but, like, I basically just plugged that into my campaign. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about it because there's people out there more creative than me. So I just go and use the stuff. A different kind of creative. You But you know, it saved me the like trying to right. think of like, I don't know if they make potions, what kind of buff will it get, you know? So yeah. that's the one I used. And that's, cause that's, I feel like a lot of the times with GMing, like anytime you unlock a new aspect, whether it's like, I'm going to homebrew my own world or I'm going to make a cool castle. Like you get, I, for me, I get like two steps in and then I go, my brain's like, and then there's this and then there's this and there's this and there's this and there's this. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like it's just overload. And I, I like, I, I'm, then I go, I don't want to do this. No, <laughs> there's no, the world doesn't exist outside of your range of view. Okay. And we'll figure it out as we go. But with a See, fort, like, it's... yeah, the okay. fort is so personal to, like, the party, though. It's like, man, you really got to nail that down. <laughs> but what you were saying. I, I just, uh, you're, you're like, uh, no. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. Surely someone else has already. <laughs> Let's go and find that. Because I don't want to do it. Uh, so it's just like, you're like, no. And I'm like, let's go stealing. <laughs> Let us so find the thing that we require. Let's just go pilfer what we need instead. Uh, I want to talk about shenanigans. Yeah. Because that's my favorite part of TTRPGs. Yeah. And I'm my question is, uh, is there such a thing as too many shenanigans? I'm sure contextually, I am like never going to give you a yes or no to any question you ask. That's fine. And that's so perfect. That. No, uh, it's exactly what I want. But like yes, if you're if you're streaming a game to an audience, and people are just like doing their own shenanigans, inside jokes, stuff like that, it's very fun for them. But it might not be good for the audience. So I'm sure at that point, that's too much shenanigans. Um, for me in my like home game at a table, I have never felt that way. Um, I very much think about building a campaign as just like this slow accretion of stuff like there's all this advice for like starting your first session with a bang like starting in the middle of things setting these high stakes immediately and i'm like no we're gonna chill we're gonna like slowly walk around and things will slowly start to orbit the players and these will get closer and it will accrete into something and mm -hmm. eventually this thing we found in session two will play off of this thing from session five in a really interesting way or you know these two things that i put out there that i never expected to interact are now interacting and the player says well doesn't it make sense then that if you know if this goblin friend that we met drinks this growth potion that we found in a different session now our goblin friend is huge and can go do this thing i'm like this is amazing i never thought yes. of that i was not Chekhov's gunning this like i was not plotting anything mm -hmm. it's just the idea of writing those weird things down on your character sheet. Mm -hmm. And if you want to keep them, you keep them there. And you're always looking at like, what's this interesting stuff? How can I add this potion to this 
action to this NPC situation. Um, and a lot of that comes from OSR like blogs in play of, uh, you know, letting the players provide problems, not solutions. I know Tony mm -hmm. talked about this a little bit when he was on um, and just like, I will continue to throw things out there that I hope are interesting and fun. And if someone engages with them, we keep continue down that road. If someone doesn't, I drop them. I often forget about them. They are, you know, it's like mm -hmm. the character that shows up in the first season of the TV show and then the after never, it's like, yeah, never to be seen to again. Never about. happened to them. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so I'm very much just like flashing things up. Like, are you interested in this? Do you want this? And then eventually those things come together in these strange and surprising ways. And to me, that's the catharsis. Like that's the fun. Mm -hmm. That's the pleasure of the game, which can be separate from the people that are like trying to construct satisfying narrative arcs or you know character uh resolutions i am not as good at that or my play style does not lead as well toward that and so i embrace the shenanigans and let them keep coming i eat them for breakfast lunch and dinner nom 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 it's a yeah. uh uh, we've got Keegan uh, in chat saying uh, Emily Axford talks about with on the rails chaos, which is shenanigans that continues to move the story forward. And I think I, I personally view shenanigans as it's fuel, right? Like it is, it's a hundred percent the thing that like, that's, that's the magic where you don't know that they're going to make a giga goblin or that you're going to fall in love with a sentient hair whip person and like <laughs> chain yourself inside the moon with them like or the sun rather like it's right. it, you find you find these like the real connection and the things that matter in inside the shenanigans like it's humor's amazing humor and comedy I think are amazing in that way is you can couch so many like really meaningful things inside of it and it makes it safe to play around it right like it's it, and it's always those kinds of things where it's like, here's that joke that we told. Oh, and now it's making us cry. So congratulations us. We've done it. <laughs> um, I have uh, an answer for this, which is um, it depends on how you look at shenanigans. Mm. The we word, should define our terms. Right? Because like, how much shenanigans is too much? It's like, well, I mean, if you look at shenanigans, it's like, high spirited behavior as like a fuel for moving the story forward then no no sh shenanigans is too much but what i feel like sometimes some people will forget uh, and i found this especially true um in some home games depending on the dynamic of the group or a lot it's much more frequent i found in like streaming when people know there is an audience I feel like uh, there can be some bit that is lost between a shenanigan and these like kind of out of the story joking. Does that make sense? That doesn't actually move anything forward. You're actually stopping everything to try and um, it's very much like a everybody stop the story. I uh, I want to entertain now. Yeah. And it's like Hey, I made a funny. Look at me. Like, everybody, I know we're trying to tell a story, but I just want to be the funniest person in the room right now. And it's like, I felt like, depending on the home group dynamic, there was like always one or two that would like kind of do that. Like, we'd be in a very serious moment. People are actually crying, like at the table, looking at their dice. And then someone would be like, well, hold on, I've got a really good joke. And it's like, now is not the time so it's read, read my answer yeah my <laughs> answer is very much like are the shenanigans in the story like are they the high-spirited behavior type of shenanigans where it's like yes i've got a wild idea and we're gonna make it work and it's moving the story and then there's what i think some people get confused about thinking is shenanigans where it's like we're all just showing up to this table and we're not interested in telling a story together we're interested in just being the like the wild and crazy one here at the table so it depends on how people see shenanigans on whether or not there's too much in my mind yeah i, think... I oh go, for go, it. Ahead. go no you're good you're good 
when I started running games, I did have the dream of like, I'm going to make people scared. I'm going to make them sad. I'm going to make them so happy. Um, and there were times that that was undermined by someone who just was not feeling that mood or reading the room or anything like that. And so I maybe a little bit sadly have like largely given up on that stuff or largely let that go out of my hands. Um, someone might get involved, but it will not be because I'm trying to lead them to that. And it's a bummer because there were moments in my early games where I was still all about like creating those emotional moments that I did. It was successful and I felt so good. And the players afterward were like, that was amazing. Um, but it is hard to patrol that in other people, especially if someone's coming to it having a really hard day or if someone drinks a little too much. And so I, like you said, you can have full shenanigans or you can have like some kind of emotional arc, but it's hard to have both. And I've just given up on the <laughs> controlling the emotional get, arc. Get rid of. Uh, and so I just, you know, like we don't, we have 90 minutes a night, maybe. We don't see each other a lot outside of this. If we only play for 45 minutes and spend the other 45 minutes catching up, that's okay. But again, like I'm not streaming the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not, yeah. you know, and so it's, I still would love to play with a group of like really serious and devoted role players. And uh, my dad game does sort of give me that. I, that's the other part of it too, is that like, if I want to run a game, I feel like I have people that will step up and play. And so I don't feel that thing that I felt growing up where like, I'm reading these books alone and I'm yearning for one or two people. Like there are so many cool communities online now and in my real life that like, even if I don't get that emotional catharsis from one campaign, I can just file it away. Be like, someday, you know, I'll find, you know, mm -hmm. in three years, you know, I'm getting old enough that I can imagine three years passing, you know, mm -hmm. just a, a few blinks. In three years, I will have these players that really want to engage in an emotional story and I'll put that together then and I'll save that until then. Um, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's you're quite I, right. I don't know that they're mutually ex exclusive though. I know Sarah... And I have both had moments uh, where it's, you know, and you'll encounter it a lot with the adventure zone, right? Something yeah. totally wild is happening. And you're like, that was the craziest thing I've ever heard. But then you're also crying from the, you can, you can have totally wild, insane shenanigans that are very much like interwoven mm -hmm. with the emotional, uh, weight to it because uh you're you're in the story you're still crafting the story you're still crafting and being this character so like even though it's a wild shenanigan it's still like but it's still all real and and meaningful to the story and the and the people involved with it so i don't i, I don't think it's like you can't have one or it's one or the other I I I get I get the feeling of like I'm just gonna drop it though because I feel like I like I'm not like because I think so much of it is dependent upon the players right like recognizing yeah. what table that you're at um, and that speaks to something Aaron said you know I'll put this on the shelf and I'll save it for later like I'll I'll find the right table for this. Uh, and that's so important because I think a lot of times it can be very easy to say no. Like, this is the kind of game I want to play. This is how we're playing it. And you're going to like it. Dang it. Uh, and maybe that's not the case. Uh, but making sure, I, from my perspective, like, I have had players where, like, they don't care about the emotional stuff at all. Like, th th that is not something that interests them at all. And honestly, neither does shenanigans. Like, they're there to, like, be a mechanical badass and do the mechanical badass things. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know why they came to my table thinking that I wasn't going to just, like, fuck with them so hard. But it happens, right? Uh, and I, I feel like it's, as a GM, the, the task is to not, is to give them problems, not solutions. And to say, hey, here's this thing. And then like wait for like a golden window of opportunity to like reach in and be like, and here's emotion. Like you weren't looking, haha, -ha, I snuck it in. Or like, 
it, to, like find the right place for it. Because I know for me, I'm like, here's my narrative beats and it has to happen in this order. And this is, but that's not really true shenanigans. That's planned chaos. Like that's not really like true emotional response. That's, that's a script that I've written. And so making like checking myself in those games in those moments to be like, this is where the players are going. I will go with them. Like the players do not care about this elaborate drama that I've written about, you know, how true love conquers all. They don't give a shit. They want to talk about this over here. You know what I mean? Like a little electric platypus that they picked up by the road. This is what we want. And it's like, okay, yes. Why I are you calling us out right now? <laughs> It's <laughs> that's just an example. You just gave an example. it to us, okay? A hundred percent. What you were expecting? A hundred percent. And so I feel like, but because I think, like, navigating that space though, as GMs, like, when do you feel like you have a good? What is there a moment that you feel like you have a good read on your table that you know, like, how to balance it? You know what I mean? Like, do you have that moment where you sit down and you go? Yes, I'm ready. I, yes, I get it now. I understand can the I, assignment. Can I tell my first super disruptive player choice story? Yes, like sort yes, of please do. Absolutely. Um, so this was, I had, we had finished our first campaign of that weekly D&D thing. And there were enough people that were making it regularly that I was splitting them into two. We were doing every other week and there were six total players in each group. Only four showed up, you know, any given week. And then once every other month we would join together for this big fun group. So I was doing all my planning and I was thinking about like, what were the problems with the last campaign? Like one, item overwhelming, like too many mm. items on the sheet. People don't know what to do with them. People don't know if they're important. Uh, and two, no like kind of generic quest. Like if this person shows up who was here last week and these two people who weren't here show up, I can't continue the thing that that other person was involved with. I just need like a generic, like maybe go do this, maybe go grab this item for me. And so I was like, I will have just a friendly museum guy and he will buy these worthless items off their character sheets. Oh, that's you awesome. Know, like every month we'll just spend 10 minutes and be like, whatever you don't want, you tell me, erase it and I'll give you money. And then he will say like, here's some stuff to go find if you ever just find yourself bored wanting to run around, please go do this. And so I was like, oh, what a brilliant idea. I've really got a handle on this. And then, um, so the players had met this slug-eyed sewer guild lady. And then I was like, well, I got to show that the world is tied together, you know? And so they're out, they're going by this wine bar and the uh, sewer guild lady is on a date with this museum guy. And that's how I'll introduce the museum guy. And she can say like, here he is. He's so good at this, like, please uh to help him out do some jobs for him and i did that and then my players were like he's not good enough for that slug-eyed woman i want to go on a date with that slug-eyed woman and i was like okay uh i'm sure we can figure that out and then they're like we need to go break into his museum i think something's up we need to find some dirt on him and we need to break these two up and then i was like okay of course <laughs> <You're free. laughs> Yes, and and then they like Aww. bust into this museum, and I was just trying to like describe like he's just a dude, but I was like, oh, and he they're has like, some no dude. one's just a dude, like, no one's like, just a dude. No, no. I, I was like, oh well, it. he, you know, he started this museum. He has like money from his dad. There's some financial records. That's Who's all his dad? And We're then gotta... they were like, no. Then they were like, oh well, he's like a, a you know, a rich one percenter. He inherited all this nepotism, money. right? And then they just like went and beat the shit out of this museum guy. And at that point, I was like, well, I have to make him an actual bad guy. I don't want them just right. up. Right. Then they'll like, feel bad. Hey. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so then I was like, yeah, no, it turns out he's also an evil wizard. And you just saved. And you you figured out the plot. <laughs> you can go on a date with her like you wanted. Amazing. You solved my puzzle. <laughs> right. Exactly. And so like, that was a moment where I was like, I think I have the solution. In I will give them the solution in game in mm -hmm. fiction mm -hmm. and that's when I was like I need to be more explicit out of the fiction and yes. out of the game and just say like hey if you're ever overwhelmed by your character sheet there's probably a dude that will buy stuff off of it we don't that's have to name amazing. Him right now. he does not have to go on any dates with anyone you know right now y yeah yeah just let the me know that's the, the best thing about that. And like, it's so true to the GM experience. You're like, I will help you. And the players are like, 
no and they don't realize they're saying no and you can't tell them that they're saying no right. like you could but then it's like you're so far in it now like no that is my true love and how dare this like sneaksy wizard go on a date with my girl and it's like you know what this is better than i could have anticipated i'm gonna just file away this entire like system that i created for you to to make your lives easier just gonna whoop that away this is what we're doing now and it's like that's that's gming that's 100%. the true shenanigans i'm talking about though it's like where it's like oh i had something written but yes yes whatever you're doing like that's the kind of like wild action that like totally rewrites the story better it makes everyone's your... contributing and yeah. it still did not solve the too many items on the character sheet the my you friend so Brett, close. She's, i know she's she was the one who was like i'm in love with this slug eyed woman and she was also <laughs> the one that would be like why does my character sheet say stolen underwear why does it say slutty pebbles costume and i was trying have to, to help like, you i don't know i had a solution at one point i obviously have to rethink things like amazing i'm not sure at this point well, and that's, it's those moments, too, that give your table and your campaign it that special something. Because, <laughs> like, you know, that's what's, we're all playing the same game or games, right? But every table comes out with just, like, the weirdest stuff. And it's moments like that where 100% guarantee the GM was just trying to do something elementary, basic, established, like, ah, truth. And it ended up becoming some grand scheme and like, nope, this is the BBEG now. And uh, I absolutely brought him back as part of like a, an Injustice League. Sinister Amazing. Team to go Poor after museum guy. Point, so. The thing is, I, like, as you were telling the story, I was picturing the little owl uh, from Animal Crossing. <laughs> and the idea that they just like broke into the museum and kicked the shit out of that little owl. Like... Oh that's man, it. man, yeah. that's rough, bud. That's a tough break. Uh, <laughs> Luca, do you have a disruptive? Do you have something similar? I know I do, but I was I was not as nice. I pushed uh, one back. time. I one time I had an elitholich, uh, BBEG, um, and my entire group decided to befriend them uh, instead of kill them. Uh, but, you know, it worked out in the end because uh, they showed up uh, at the end fight uh, with all these really hot ladies from space uh, slash the Astral Sea uh, to uh, join the fight and save everyone's asses. But uh, I was definitely expecting that session to go much different when they were running around the Alithalich's lair. It's like, all right, we're going to have a real cool battle. He's got level 10 spells. Let's go. And uh, it, and then instead they were like, "You doing some science in here? You creating some new spells? This is cool. I uh, want to be friends." <laughs> it was like, "Can oh. you help us, please, please, please?" Okay, but it worked out so cool in the end because we got that whole battleship mm -hmm. Galactica or Battlestar Galactica moment where they boom into the planet with all of his uh, astral ladies. Heck yeah, cool. bud. Um, mine. I was a very new GM. And I had taken my party to a city, and because oh. they were they were following someone, uh, and they were in the city, so now we can give them like multiple quests or whatever, right? Uh, and they were they were following a thread, and I was being like, "Here's a quest over here, and here's a quest over here, and here's the stuff over here." And uh, the person who was kind of leading the party was like, "Not into any of it, like no, none of it. We're doing this thing that I had not accounted for at all." And I was a brand new GM and I was like, you can't go over there. It's just gray. Like there's nothing there. I wasn't confident like in my improbabilities or being able to like go on the fly. So I and I was I was so frustrated because it was like, can you not tell that I have like 50 other things over here which you could engage with? And yet you just keep picking this one that will break everything. Why are you doing this? Um, and eventually, uh, they, he, they wanted to go to a fancy part of town where the aristocrats lived, uh, and they wanted to get fancy clothes. And I was like, I, again, like, I don't have a shop. I don't have anything. And so I was like, okay, fine. You find a, a shop and it's, uh, Sean does. I don't know. Like, sure. You're at Sean Finery's. 
uh, <laughs> the player went in and was accosted the the on the spot NPC that I had crafted into existence and said, "I want the finest set of clothes you have." And I was like, "Okay, the finest set of clothes." And yes, the finest set of clothes. Here's money. I just want the finest set of clothes you have. And I was like, "Okay, here's." Sh- she she does that. She brings you the finest set of clothes they have. And my player's like, great. I put it on and I go outside. I'm like, great. You go outside in a ball gown. <laughs> like in a full on, <laughs> like ridiculous ball gown. And they, he looked at me and was like, are you, are you kidding? And I was like, no. <laughs> like, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. But it ended up being like this wonderful, like I'll never forget this moment where like, this very edgy, like, edgelord warlock, like, got in a fight with everybody they interacted with, walked out of Shonda's fineries in, like, a ball gown, <laughs> full daylight. <laughs> and it was, like, it's one of those things, like, we would laugh about it, like, after. But in the moment, I was, like, so stressed and pressed of, like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And, like, it ended up, it ended up, you know, going way off the rails after that but that was the first time where i was like oh no literally you can't convince the players to care about anything they don't want to care about ever like no never it's it's not it's not a thing that is within your power so accepting that this is the thing they want to do and it's not the vision that you crafted in your mind but like embrace embrace their shenanigans because that's what you're doing now uh and lean in and maybe try to sneak in your bits and pieces along the way uh, makes for a much better time, for sure. Uh, we are about at the hour mark, so I'm going to suggest that we take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to remind chat uh, that we want this to be a conversation. So if you have questions or comments about the three pillars of TTRPGs being shenanigans, flirting, and forts, uh, drop them in chat. We're keeping an eye out, uh, but we're going to go you know, refill our coffee or beverage of choice. Uh, stretch a little bit I recommend that you do as well Uh, and we will be right back and we're back Uh, we hope that you got uh, food and and water or something to drink uh, and eat we had a little bit of a show and tell and I'm making Aaron uh, show some of it Uh, can you particularly the last bit because that was very very good and shenanigans related yeah, so it started with, I did find all the old character sheets, and I don't know how visible this will be, but like they are covered front and back with text, which is fun and cool, but also very hard to navigate when you're level 12, you know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. But also it came with an envelope of words, which a ghost of books used to write love notes to one so of the players who decided he was her boyfriend. So like the classic put coffee on the maps thing. And then, what is on the is that like some weird eldritch horror what is the yeah so these are a bunch of yes. different worlds i love that i'm leaning into my yeah. digital screen there's a maw at the center but then we had an in-game zine fest and so i asked these players to make zines their characters made and you'd get a bonus if you brought them so two of them made little zines uh one not with is... the tassel is that a magazine about freeing the nipple no, this is not worth the tassel. A carefully reasoned and nigh irrefutable critique of the corn god. Um, Amazing. So involved with the corn god, and this wizard was like, not not real. That's a lie. And then this one is War Quarterly, which was made by a war cleric, and just about like cool war stuff that he had learned. Are this there is illustrations. Very good. Yeah, it's full. Like they did full layout. I mean, it looks like it was laid out uh. in like ms word or whatever but But, like looks awesome phenomenal phenomenal bad religion against the grain it's like a corn thing (laughs) it's so good it's so good i love that though yeah yeah no very good top tier like inspiration forever (laughs) again and like this is just like our stuff like to bring it back to what we were talking about like as gaming is this like private community it's weird because i say private but it's very communal but mm-hmm. it's like I, I just mean like the it's shared not stream, experience it's not mm-hmm. for content um, yeah but just like these physical remembrances from that are mm-hmm. so fun to look back on so i the the lore and artifacts that build out from a campaign are like some of my favorite things like i'm i'm a 
ridiculous note taker. And sometimes I'll go back and like read through like the old campaign and like the, the quotes and the goofs and everything that comes from it. Like, uh, it just does my heart so much good because it's like, again, it's that communal storytelling and shared experience that like is the magic of it all. I yeah, love shenanigans. it. Shenanigans. Make those shenanigans yes. happen. Make the shenanigans happen. 100%. Um, we've talked about forts. We've talked about shenanigans and we can talk about shenanigans even more. Uh, but one thing I want to talk about, because I think, because one of these pillars, I think, can be tricksy to navigate, and that is flirting. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, how do you prepare your players and your table for flirting? Like, what prep as a GM do you put in? And like, because I, there's, this is going to be a long answer that's going to meander, but like, up front, what you're like, there's going to be flirting at my table. What do you, how do you go in and approach it? I did not say that. And that first game that I mentioned, like right when 5e was coming out, I just assumed it would be, you know, it was maybe like two thirds dudes, a third women. And I assumed it would just be like running around, exploring some fighting. Um, and there was like a little bit of flirting, but a lot of it was like kind of downtime stuff. Like, oh, I thought, you know, I would bring this person flowers or whatever. And I was just like, cool. Describe that scene if you want, or we can just assume it happened. But then when I split it into two groups, um, it was just based on schedule. Like who can make this Wednesday? Who can make the one after? And then we alternate. And one of the groups ended up like all cis men, mostly straight. And then the other group was like four women, uh, a gay dude and my friend Joel, who is just like from a small town in Wisconsin, was like, who are these people? Like, Good luck, Joel. Really Godspeed. Before. Oh, Joel is amazing. I love the categorization there, and though. Like, Joel. four women, one gay dude, my friend and Joel. Joel. And just Joel. in their own category, all by themselves. They cannot be described by any of those other descriptors. Uh, he's, just I mean, my he's, friend Joel. He was, like, younger than me. I mean, he's, like, now engaged to a non-binary person and has, you know, opened yeah. his mind to the whole possibility of the world. But <laughs> um, at the time, was still just, like, a quiet dude from a small town in Wisconsin. And so um, quickly they became known to each other as boy team and date team. Amazing. The do their do boy I was just going to ask. <laughs> and then date team was the one that was, like, this museum guy? He's not right for our slug-eyed <laughs> sewer guilt girlfriend. And like Fucking this up. this ghost made of a bunch of dead books, he's my boyfriend now and he will send me notes with these chopped up things. And just like all they wanted to do was go on dates and then like have those dates disrupted and then get justice on these people for disrupting their dates. Um, and I did not bring any of that on. Right, it came from them. <laughs> Right. And I was fine with it. Um, like, I, it never felt like it crossed the line. I feel like we did say at some point, like, you know, just want to check in. Like, I am never going to want to describe, like, explicit sexual acts while we're all hanging out here as friends. But, like, Be weird. I'm fine with you going on dates with people. Like, I'm fine with, you know, smooching. I'm fine with, like, if people want to cohabitate. You know, like, if this mm -hmm. wants to become a relationship drama, that's also fine with me. Um and so then it just became like, you know, 5e does not have a lot of support for that. There's some fun stuff in the optional carousing rules um, of like, oh, you have a one night stand. How did it go? And we actually ended up carousing so much that I had to write new carousing tables because they used, they hit every result. They kept, with, they kept having the same ones and they're like, not again. <laughs> there would be times where we would hang out and it would be like, you know, uh, after Trump was elected or whatever. And they're like, oh, I don't really want to, I can't, I feel like I can't really play a lot tonight. Like my concentration just isn't here, but can we roll on a carousing table? And I was like, yes. And so that would be a whole session. It was just six people rolling a D100 and talking about the result they got. Um, Amazing. It's really good. Again, like shenanigans. How can I enable these shenanigans? But um, mm -hmm. yeah, flirting became, like when I started writing Patrick World, it was mostly for this group but I did want it to be something that other people could read because I was asking for money to like print them and stuff. And so 
um, there's a little bit in there just about session zero stuff and expectations and about like part of it is just the questions and the moves are often like they're both in character and in out of character so if you roll on a move you get to ask a number of questions that you get to choose and it can be like what happened here recently or what am i not seeing or it can be like kind of can I flirt with you? Can I like, how do you feel about me kind of stuff? And so I wanted a number of options. Do you that... like me? Check yes or, <laughs> yes no. or no. That's what I wanted. Like I wanted, I just thought like, if I can reduce it down to the most kind of, uh, not saccharine, but like we see that everyone has seen that if not in real life, then in a movie, like that first initial gateway and it's answered out of character. And so everyone can say like, Hey, I'm not really done with that. Or yeah first step complete like we can talk about what that means afterwards but at least for that first step like i'm cool with the flirtation and mm -hmm. so i don't you know you can't for me at least when i'm writing rules i get into a headspace of like what if this terrible edge case happens what if this worst case scenario mm -hmm. happens like how can i write a rule against that mm -hmm. you can't Oh yeah, um, the the like, the you cannot predict the shenanigans. The unknowns, the unknowns are just too vast, too vast. Shenaniganry, shenaniganry. Yes, there's totally. That's how. Yep, yep. <laughs> That's and, it. Um, you found it. <laughs> I worked for two years doing like uh, writing and marketing for a company that made websites, and multiple times, like two years is not a long time, and multiple times, someone me or someone else would write something and then we would have a meeting about it and someone in the room would interpret it as the literal opposite and it's just it's like maybe they didn't read that closely maybe they read fast maybe they come from a different background of like mm -hmm. reading and interpretation but like i kind of just came to believe that like you cannot write the perfect sentence and so there has right. to reach a place you have to reach a place where it's like this is good enough or like I am not responsible for what people This do is the rules. best I can do. Like, this is the, the, I cannot define a more clear set of parameters. Like, it right. is beyond me. This is and what someone, I've got. Yeah, to my someone, soul right now. <laughs> <laughs> if someone is manipulative, if they're shitty, they're going to find a way to manipulate whatever mm -hmm. you write. Like, mm -hmm. and you are not the cause of that person doing right. it. That person is doing it. Right. And so I did just try to set some very basic, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah is fine yeah we can always check in you can send mm -hmm. me a private message you can mm -hmm. ask someone else in the group to ask me about it and i will you know i never have yeah. to know that you were whatever um mm -hmm. so a lot of that is just kind of out of character table talk and i'm very lucky that i mostly play with people that i know really well and um you know some of them just make very clear like my goal in this game there's a place in patrick world to write your goals my friend's like, I want to start a lesbian bar and I want to take this woman on a date that we met. And it's like, cool, you have made that known. We'll make that happen. When it happens, like, I can just say, here you go. You take this You've done it. Yeah. How much do you want to talk about it? Like, what, what do you do? Where do you want to go? Um, and, you know, by stating it publicly, it becomes uh, a way of saying, I'm okay with other people seeing this and knowing it versus, you know, People are welcome to keep it privately and just hope it happens and that's fine too mm -hmm. not an answer i gave you a total no no i it was it was, it was it was great because it, it's to to summarize what i hear you saying aaron uh is that oftentimes like if you have the mutual trust and you're you're going slowly and working like one-on-one -on -one with clear communication and expectations of like what it is uh because to your point and something i'd love to go back to is you had the two very you had what was it? Uh, the date, the date crew, and the and the dude crew. <laughs> like, right. it's I I find it interesting because flirting is one of those mechanics, or I say mechanics is one of those <laughs> topics, genres, areas that I feel like people are into or they're not. And like, uh, even in my own game, like one of the one of the first sessions that I like ran, like the plot of the session was a love story. Like it was. And it was like this like deep romantic, like true love conquers all kind of vibes. And I remember going into the session being like, they're going to hate it. My players aren't, they're going to think this is the grossest. Like I was like so nervous. I was like, this is just 
going to be the worst. It wasn't. It was so much fun and a, a huge blast. But I was like terrified of like, I, I felt uncomfortable and awkward bringing romance into TTRPGs where we're like big, tough adventurers and we punch all the feelings. Like it was like, punch it felt the feelings. <laughs> it felt weird. It felt weird. And so I kind of want to like circle back to like, you know, as, as a GM and as like a, a it, you do have to kind of go where the players want to go, but do you find yourself like introducing or like pushing flirting? Not that sounds bad. Do you, it, do you flirt introduce with <laughs> flirt with me? God, you coward. Uh, but like <laughs> legitimately like have, did your dude crew ever like lean into that at all? I guess is my question. Like the yeah, date, like date team was like, yep. From the jump. But did dude crew ever just kind of organically go that direction? Yeah, so they, like I said, they would unite every month or two for a mm -hmm. bigger thing. And it was very funny to have them be like, oh, so what have you been up to? We've been exploring this like chain of alternate worlds and fighting this stuff. And we killed some zombies and these people are after us. What are you up to? And it's like, well, we ruined a guy's life by wrecking his museum and breaking him up with someone who is now my girlfriend. And then he went on a date to, you know it's just like so mm -hmm. you know and, huge success right, right and so they were just like oh different games um and so then at one point you know just like player attrition happened and people couldn't make it and we did rejoin those two groups because they got small enough and it was some interesting bleed then to see you know one of the guys from uh from from boy team was very much like actually can I like court this person like in a very formal way? And I was like, yeah, of course, welcome to the team. And then also people on date team were like, wait, we can get mad at someone and just go kick the shit out of them because we've seen them be bad? This rules. And so there was some very funny like cross-pollination of uh, motivations and, and goals that were not realized before that. Influencing each other's play style for good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, I love that. Um, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about consent and stuff as well in this space, like, and how important it is to make sure that everybody's on the same page and understands. Uh, Luca, I know you have a little more involved process for, like, when you're onboarding, like, with a campaign and everything of this is what mm -hmm. you can expect. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so a long time ago, um, I <laughs> when I started running Harper's, it was very similar to how you described, Aaron, where it was like a rotating, uh, it was at the height of COVID, and my answer was like, we're all online, we all want to play, but everyone's got different schedules and commitments, so how do I run a campaign where anyone can jump in, they can play this week but they can't play next week so it's like okay rotating cast and we have the hideout to like anchor them to a place and we send them out on jobs uh we'll associate them with the fact uh, with the faction harpers um so that they kind of have like a sense of community and why they're doing this um and then because of that there wasn't really much as people would join mid-campaign so there was no real space or opportunity really to have a session zero so it was, I, I, I ended up creating a web page, which is like, hi, here's me as a DM. Nice to meet you. Here's what you can expect from my play style. Here's what I expect of you and your play style. Uh, and we will get along great. Not everyone has the same play styles. If this isn't for you, it's better you know now than when we're all at the table together. Um, here's my homebrew rules. Here's how I expect you to treat everyone else at the table. We're streaming, so please keep these things in mind. And also, here's consent and safety. And I would always, I have a few um, hard lines uh, that I always have, like there's just some things that don't exist or happen in my worlds. It's just not a thing. If it happened in your backstory, then fine. But don't talk about it on stream unless everyone's okay with it, you know. Um, so it's like, fill out your stuff and then we will, I will go through everyone's submissions, let everyone know we're not doing these things. Just don't do it. Or if you want to do these things, let's talk about it first, give warning. Um, and so it was kind of like, 
a session zero in a web page <laughs> that I could just send out to everyone uh, and try and get everyone on the same page of like what to expect, how the vibe would be, um, and like how to play respectfully with each other. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's kind of how, where you say where it's like, no matter how well you craft a sentence or how much time you put into thinking, how can I convey this information in a clear way so that everyone understands, like some people just don't read, some people put weird tone on it. It's just, but sometimes it worked out really well. And we got by the end of the campaign, I feel like we had a table that just worked so well together by the end we really it felt like very much a a family level of home game by the end of it mm -hmm. and i, I feel like even though we accept that people will mess that up it's far better to do what you did and still have it there yeah you gotta do it no, even if even if your people don't read or you know <laughs> like, oh, right you still gotta do the thing you an, still attempt was made. An, an attempt, attempt was made an attempt was made if nothing mm -hmm. else yeah mm-hmm because it's, it's, I feel like uh, Saint says this, a message communicated is not a message received. Uh, <laughs> and I, I feel like particularly with flirting and romantic inclinations in TTRPGs, like it's, it can be really challenging. Because like, I mean, and that's a challenging space in real life. Like we joked about like, do you like me? Yes or no. But like, it can be hard to know, like in real life, let alone bringing it into like a fantasy world where like anything is possible and and helping each other navigate that space respectfully, uh, I think is so important for people to go in with like thought and care to make sure that like everybody's still having a good time, you know, um, because I feel like for me and this is where it gets interesting and um as like a, a feminine person in the space, uh, I feel like a lot of the times, like uh, it can be very easy. And here's the thing, like, hello, I'm Sarah. If I'm in a game with you and your character is interested in flirting with my character, let's talk about it. Cause like, heck yeah. Uh, but like, I do think that sometimes there can be the unfortunate assumption uh, that like, that's gonna be the case all the time e everywhere. And it's like, if we talk about it, maybe, but like sometimes like you have the unfortunate circumstance of someone just like swinging for the fence and you going, oh, that's doesn't resonate with me at all, buddy. And then like you just have that awkward like and then no one's having a good time. Right. Uh, and no one's having a good no time. No one's having a good time because like the the bid uh, fails and we all feel awkward and we don't know what to do with our hands. And so it's just kind of like, uh, let's go save this dragon, I guess, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, um, but it like, to your point, Aaron, I would say like, some of the most meaningful, like romantic, cute, flirty moments that I've had as a GM came from like, just that slow, like, oh, player, I have the intention of flirting with this person and me being like, okay, how would you like, how would you like to do that? And if they respond in this way, like, and just kind of slowly feeling it out and never having that explicit conversation of like, you trying to fuck? Like, it was never like that. It was just very sweet and sincere and ultimately ended in like one of the cutest little like love stories ever. And then the player ended up bringing like the kid of that relationship into another campaign later. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, it was just over so, so good and so, so sweet. But that navigation of that space was tricksy or can yeah. be tricksy. Yeah, I was lucky I never had like player on player interest or anything like that. And I think a lot of times if someone was like, I want to date this person, I would just be like, cool. Like, just tell me what you want to do. Like if there was none of these, you know, it was never like, I want to seduce this nun who's taken a vow of chastity. And, you know, it was never any right. kind of extreme thing. It was just like, this person seems cool. I think it would be cool if that person and my character were out and about on dates. And it'd just be like, great, tell me what that is. And then I'd just be like, we go to this uh, nice prairie and I bring a picnic and blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, I never felt like 
I had to enact flirtation. It was just mm. almost handing over, you know, you set some scenes and you say kind of what your approach is and your level is, and they just got to describe it. And no one was ever like pushing for extremes or anything. So again, mm -hmm. I feel very lucky. One, that I only really started running games after I was cool, after I turned 30. Yes. So there was mm -hmm. less very, two, very fortunate. Like, very fortunate. Like, <laughs> my players are just very cool and just like down. They're just, they just want to hang out. Like, again, like this is poker night for us. Like we don't mm -hmm. want to rile anyone up. We don't want to bring our uh, unprocessed emotions to something. Mm -hmm. Or if we do, we save. Like I said, like, I don't feel up to playing. I would like to roll mm -hmm. dice twice and tell a funny story. And we, I don't want to get any deeper. I don't want to do this emotional stuff tonight. I'm not feeling good. Yeah. And um, like that success story is on them. It's not because I did something amazing. It's yeah. because they were mature and vocal about what they needed. And I love that. I appreciate it. So. Yeah. I, I, I like, th it's funny. Like it is that thing where it's the social contract, right? Uh, I, the, yeah. I, I'm the biggest McElroy fan. It's absurd, but I live by the three midnight amendments. Uh, come on, be cool, nice. Do you know? Do you recall this no, bit? Uh, oh, be Aaron, cool. nice. I'll send nice. you. I'll send you the bit, Aaron, and you'll remember. Okay. It was. It was pretty early on, but it's uh, the three midnight amendments. Come on, be cool, nice. Uh, and that's. It is that. Be cool, like it, it just. Don't don't make it weird. Don't make it weird. And I think for the most part, particularly with home games, it's really easy to like exist in that space. You're playing with your friends. Oftentimes they're people, you know them in real life. You spend a lot of time together. You have a lot of trust built up there. So it is very easy to be like, hey, go hit on that, go hit on that person, or I would like to take them on a date or whatever. And it's a lot easier to navigate that. Like even in my very first home game, flirting came out almost immediately. Like we were like three sessions in it was a bunch of couples like sitting around a table and uh th this one of the players was like yeah no I super duper want to try and hook up with that NPC and our GM was like oh okay and like we hadn't really talked about it going in but it was that funny like here's all these friends we've like you know known each other for years hanging out and all of a sudden we're we're all like, well, did it work? Like, is he into it? Like, <laughs> let's <laughs> right, like leaning yeah. in. Like, Just, is she okay, gonna get the digits? <laughs> like, and, and then did then it, it work? Can I wingman? What's what's, right, what's happening right, over here? Right, and then like the natural like flow of that leaning into the shenanigans of like, yes, she was successful in getting the date, uh, but the mysterious stranger refused to take their mask off, and then but under the mask was another mask, like that kind of like. <laughs> vibe and it was it was just wonderful um but it all kind of came from it was totally unexpected and i like i would encourage people to like not be afraid of like flirting in your games like it, it is heavy and it is it can be scary but like if you have the trust with your players just because the motivation and like connection that comes from that is like so sweet and sincere and such good like uh, motivation for the rest of your story you know what I mean and characters what's more what's more motivating than like rescuing your girlfriend from the evil museum man like think about that your future girlfriend <laughs> your future <What>? girlfriend <laughs> no it's already we're already done deal <laughs> yeah I, I like though um also for for people that are uh that struggle sometimes with the bringing romantic things to a public table i really like the the thought that like flirting doesn't have to be thirsty it doesn't have to be romantic flirting can just be like i brought around. you this rock <laughs> what's up hey i kind of like you not in any weird way but you know you want to you want to go look at trees together or something do something weird it's like you can you can flirt uh platonically as well so I, I, I like that it just kind of applies to any and all. It's It really just comes down to the be cool. Be cool. Nice. Well, and my favorite actual play podcast is Friends at the Table. Um, a phenomenal. It's a phenomenal podcast. It's amazing because they'll do these uh, post-mortems on their seasons. 
and you know they people will be dating a player character will be dating a non-player character and then they'll ask in the postmortem like oh Allie, uh your character hella was obviously dating this god of death woman like how did that happen and i was like i never got that like they had so many mm. scenes together when it was just them talking and having these kind of pregnant pauses and stuff but like luca was saying like it doesn't have to be like show us clinking our glasses and on a date together show us waking up in bed together it can just be like i have a big problem and i want to run it by this person and to me that's a romantic relationship oh. that's the mm -hmm. important part of, in the story i am opening myself to this person and you don't see a lot of that on camera um and so it's just like oh you can just it can be a chivalric romance it can be uh, a flirty romance or it can be like a very kind of friendly or you just like those late night talks that you have with people like that can be what we, romance right well that, that can be what we oh, see yes. of your romance it doesn't have to be something that we tie to monogamy or a, a future in marriage or anything like that mm -hmm. i love that distinction and luca your addition of like the bromance right like flirting in all of its forms i uh, like because yeah. i like we it's funny because we were like let's define what shenaniganry is like what is flirting like again <laughs> i think i think it's that shorthand of for me it is the shorthand of like intimacy of and in all of its various forms whether that's via friendship or romantic interest or or just partnership in general i think that like that intimate connection of you're a person that i trust and care about uh exactly can be represented there but what do you guys think no that's exactly it intimacy doesn't always have to be like intimacy <laughs> it can be like intimacy you know like <laughs> can be like intimacy bro <laughs> intimacy no but like it's like i mean that's extremely like that got me in the feels where it's like yeah you're not necessarily like Net netflix and chill in this scene you're talking to them about a problem that's really got you upset like that's and you haven't that's told like anyone else real, this thing. Yeah, yeah that's that's the kind of that's the kind of intimacy that you know it doesn't always have to be like some thirsty romantic intimacy it can just be intimate mm -hmm. and then if close. you see someone like sharing those problems off and on throughout a year and then like at the very end they like touch hands that has as much to me. That's like, how pride and prejudice. Yeah. I'm just like, they yep, made the yep. emotional, physical. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that all three of us simultaneously, like <laughs> that, yeah, like just, that is... yearning, pride and prejudice, kind of like, oh my yeah. god, like they're talking, about, like, oh gosh, if there's that that 100 percent is your girl's drug, like that that <laughs> silent pining, that, that like man, that forehead that, kiss kind of that the like, bront sisters like forbidden and yet like it just oh gets me every time like that and and i feel like it's sitting at the table it's like watching like are they gonna are they gonna do the thing are they gonna do the thing are they gonna they do brushed, the thing they brushed fingers while walking next to each mm -hmm. <laughs> yes good it's shit. so good good shit um here's a question so we we've gone over the three pillars and i would like to dissect our play styles so if like if you have a hundred percent right from so one or zero to a hundred what percentage like how would you break out your game like you're 33 percent in all three pillars you're you know what i mean like 60 40 like whatever like zero how would you in like break out a game for you using those three pillars like what do you rely on most as a GM or as a player, mm -hmm. or let's do both. As, let's starting as a GM. Like, what's your style? I. It's so funny because you're talking about like you know filling these bars of percentages, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I I feel like I am a I am a haunted theme park, and the players come and just these three gates open, one of each, and it's like step through <laughs> whichever you wish. You can always choose your character. You know, like, <laughs> I would I. You know, I try to load every barrel before I start any kind of campaign of just like, here's a place for you to live. Uh, I think the shenanigans thing really came from, do you know the bag of beans in mm -hmm. D&D? 
which is a very yeah, good bag. Like very good bag. Things. Yes. Uh, yes. Someone found a bag of beans and it oh, just no. the most conservative player is play style wise, like the note taker, the quiet one. Um, and then every session after that, people just start chanting like beans, 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 <laughs> or like bean out, bean out. And so like <laughs> for me, it's not about uh like putting those things into action so much as like leaving them stationary and then let someone come by and just run with it grab it and run with it um again i'm sorry i said i would never answer a question yes no that's a hundred that's that's absolutely a a viable answer there's nothing wrong with that at all uh beans 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 beans. beans. (laughs) i love that though and like the Magical items, if you're not, like, this is 100%, this is an opinion of Sarah, and you can ignore it, because she's just a person, but I think giving your players the most useless magical items is, like, yes. the best. Like, yes. give them campaign-breaking shit to see how they use it, because it becomes just, like, um, it just, it gets so great to, like, Give your players more items and watch Taskmaster. These are your GM assignments. Yes. Because, like, Taskmasters, uh, it's like a, a British comedy show. They bring comedians on and they give them a task and they have to complete it. But, like, the way in which people interpret the rules and what they need to do, it gets buck wild and weird. And if that's not, like, if you're thinking about GMing, never gemmed. Watch Taskmaster so you know just how bad it can get. <laughs> or great it can get, rather. Great. Um, how great. How great it can get. Because, uh, like, having those magical items and then watching people use them for good or shenanigans is just top tier. It's just the best. <laughs> beans, beans, beans forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, we're, we're getting close on time. And I'm pretty sure Tony will never speak to me again if I don't uh, yes. ask a, a couple of questions. And I promise that I will. I promise that I will. But Aaron, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, After the Bomb and uh, your other games that you've written. Uh, Patchwork People, uh, Patchwork World. I played in a game run by Keegan where we used uh, Patchwork People as a part of it. And it was phenomenal. Uh, but could you give us like a quick rundown of both of those games? Like a Cliff Notes, the, what what's their deal? And also... What's the best place to flirt in After the Bomb? Um, After the Bomb is uh, just a direct swipe. It's everything I love about Fallout, the video games, which I've been a fan of since the original like top-down isometric ones. Um, it uses the Together We Go system that Tony is the publisher and kind of figurehead of. Um, so if, if you're familiar with Fallout, it's just a post-apocalyptic uh, kind of post post apocalyptic you're not dealing directly with the immediate dangers but you're rebuilding communities and reconnecting places uh but very influenced by like satire of 50s americana and the nuclear family nuclear explosion Uh um and so if you look at after the bomb which is free it is a set of rules and then also a separate book that is uh locations and campaigns in uh, bombed out Minneapolis. Uh, there's lots of good flirting places. I mean, but where's the best one? Where's the, the best? best Primo, the best, take your slow guy girlfriend on a date place. The best flirting place is in the secret submarine of Swamp Girl Radio, uh, hiding under Lake Bede Makaska, uh, mm-hmm. with in now uptown Minneapolis, but uh, it's a bombed out swamp. But I do there's like a that. secret mutant run radio station and she's spinning old vinyl that she finds this is very good uh tony if you donate ten dollars to our patreon you can unlock additional places to flirt in after the bomb uh so definitely check out the links that will be posted for that very exclusive patreon you're welcome um yeah and patrick world is like i would say my flagship game my biggest game my most full game um i wrote it for zine quest 2020 i think that was like the start of the pandemic, so my brain is gone. I think I like that's when I funded it, February 2020, and then was writing it in like March, April, May of 2020. 
in the fullness of the pandemic. And I, it won't, like I started, as I said, like, this is for my players. It's everything they love about the game. It's everything they love about playing games together and like removes everything that's hard about it. But then it became, <laughs> the start of the pandemic, I had like a terrible ear infection and it Oof. became like, I am dying. I must finish this game to leave something for the world. This <laughs> like, is my legacy. I will be remembered. <laughs> right, and so it, it did become like it's. Uh, someone caught me. Someone was like, "Wow, this is the most you thing ever." And so it is very personal to me. Um, but it's a powered by the apocalypse uh, fantasy game, weird fantasy. You can uh, burst into cats. You can have a flying yes. leap that you ride around. Um, lots of weird stuff like that, but also lots of very just explicit. You can have an ability that's just called new friend. And it is what Luca was talking about, where you just say this person that we just met, even if they seem like the worst bad guy, I'm playing my new friend move and they're not my new friend. And you convert that move into this person becomes your friend and they have things they need and they have things they can help you with. And, um, just kind of really explicitly trying to mechanize all those play behaviors that I love so much from my friends. So you can get a castle, you can have a tavern, you can grow crystals in your garden. Um, you can have a helmet that's an eye that lets you see through things. And you could just, but you could also just be a dude with like heavy armor and a nice weapon. Um, so. the, the shenanigan potential of Patchwork World is high. Like we played it, we again, we played it with Patchwork people. So we would, it was, uh, you would die and come back as a new person based on tables that Keegan developed. Uh, but using some of the powers like turning into a bunch of cats and just running into the wilderness. Uh, I mean, like it started, we all started out as like general people, but at one point I was a baby who like was growing fungus in my diaper. Like it was just out of control fun and like getting to like actually like lean in and like stick like in a in a place and play with some more of those mechanics like it just it felt very fun and I loved one thing that I loved about it was uh you kind of describing your actions as you were going through like here's here's your levels of success you describe like what you're going to do and that can kind of help uh change that level of success I loved that because like as a player, 100% I want to like be able to do the thing I want to do. But yeah. it's written in such a way that you really do have to justify what you're doing, but it justify it through shenanigans. <laughs> like yeah, and that, it was amazing. From, I mean, it's Power by the Apocalypse, so Apocalypse yes. World provided a lot of framework. And then um, the roll with the question stuff, which I think is what you're yes. talking about. Yes. It'll say, like, when you do this move, answer these questions. Are you, you know, have you witnessed them acting unjustly? If yes, you had one. And it, um, mm -hmm. that's all from Brandon Leon Gambetta's. Passion de las Pasiones, which is a telenovela, like soap opera game that is one of the most inspiring games I've read recently. So definitely check that out as well. It'll actually be coming out from Evil Hat in like a nice full game sometime soon. So mm -hmm. keep an eye out for that. That's awesome. Um, the last question. You got to give the people what they want, Aaron. You got to talk about Minicon. You gotta talk about uh, Minicon I, I keep 2022. About this Minicon, uh, Minicon mostly started in as chat. a joke, <laughs> right? <laughs> it started as a joke, but it is now real. I don't know how much I've talked about this to other people. Uh, I have on my birthday. I have a December birthday, which means I have not gotten to celebrate it for years because of the pandemic. And so, June 11th, if people want to come to Minneapolis, there will be a karaoke party in my backyard. And that's it. <laughs> that's all I have planned so far. But I am like here to help people plan trips and find places to stay. And yeah. if you want to see this weird city I live in, uh, you can do that. We'll, we'll probably play some games if people actually show up. Amazing. So. My ambition, uh, my one goal for Minicon is to recreate the picture with you and Tony, with me just in the background, just like, yes. just being awkward. Like you guys look amazing and very good. And then I'm just like a gremlin, like hands and face pressed to the window. I love uh, it. Oh, there's an Amtrak station here. There's an airport here. <laughs> Flying is obviously weird right now, but uh, yeah, if you actually want to make it, and I know you, I'm not inviting strangers to my house. Yeah, Sorry. hey, strangers, but strangers, we're have, not flirting with you right now, go away. Uh, no, go away. Strangers you have beware. A month and a half. You have a month and a half to befriend me. <laughs> 
<laughs> get to flirting. To give you my address, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, for real. Like if people are watching, and you know, if Tony's there and if Keegan's there, uh, I'm all about this. I will. Amazing. Maybe we could run an Indiegogo or something to defray some costs. If people oh, there it. we go. We'll figure it out. We'll make it. We can, and we. Uh, it's pay ten dollars to the Patreon, and you can help decide what uh, indie games we play. Uh, we have a lot of designers options to choose from. So, yeah. uh, and if you pay, if you pay us ten dollars to pay you ten dollars, uh, something magical will happen. So, <laughs> the lore, the lore of Solar Side stretches far and wide. <laughs> yeah. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on Murder and Coffee today to talk thank to us you. about all this stuff. This has been amazing and just such a great conversation. Um, we're going to start wrapping up here. Luca, is there any other questions or items you want to touch on? Uh, no, just, uh, Aaron, can you tell chat where they can find you and your games, your content? Yeah, I am terrible at branding, so all my stuff has a different URL or username. Um, but just find me at Aaron MF King on Twitter, and there will be links there. Awesome. Uh, Luca? What about you? Tell the people who you are. If they don't know, they should know. But if they Hi. don't, um, I'm I'm Luke Lock. Um, I'm uh, I, I don't know. I'm now in charge of TPK Roleplay. I do that, so you can find me there all the time, um, all the time, including this weekend. Um, but if you go to Luke Lock anywhere, uh, that's me. So. <laughs> I I did get on board with the branding mostly because it's been my brand since I was three. So, um, you can find me here, especially though this weekend because I uh, am in all the streams this weekend on TBK Roleplay, including uh, Terminator: Past Annihilation tomorrow, um, and uh, our special Coven one-shot, Basic Witches, uh, which will be a lot Amazing. of fun. Um, so uh, there's that, but otherwise just find me, uh, probably Twitter's the best place to go to find what I'm up to. Uh, that leaves Sarah. just me. Yeah, yeah. I'm Osarex Franco. Uh, you can find me at all of the social media places, every single one at Osarex Franco. Uh, I do a variety of TTRPG content here on TBK Roleplay and across some incredible communities. Uh, we have plus one EXP folks uh, in chat now. Uh, there's Neon Lights Roleplay, Nat 20, Critical Misses, uh, all phenomenal communities and deserve your support. So go check out all of the different games and systems being run and the incredible stories being told there. Um, but uh, in the meantime, and until next time, enjoy your piping hot coffee. And your cold-blooded murders. We'll see you next time, guys.